Thank you so much. Here we are again. Where exactly, we might not be sure. And why exactly, we may not agree. So let me state what I know with as much certainty as I can muster. We are not here because life is wonderful. We are here because life is exhilarating, heartbreaking, disorienting, soul shaking. We are not here because people are easy. We are here because we are most human, most humane. When we have one another to hold up the mirror and show us the entirety of our possibility. We are not here because we have answers. We are here because we are, each of us, lost and found all at once, seeking grace and showing it, finding our way home together. Let's pray for a moment. You don't have to. You can relax. Follow your breath in and out of your body. And we'll just begin. Our friend, thank you for this day. Thank you for gathering this community. We know that there have been many joys and sorrows mentioned, and we are grateful and tender for each. I pray that this day would be one in which we allow ourselves to be transformed by our community and to take that transformation into the world. For these things, we give thanks and say, Amen. There is an ancient wisdom story in the book of Luke about a man who has two sons. The baby brother says to his father, Dad, listen. I want right now what's coming to me. Kind of stunning. I would never say that to my dad. And it's easy to focus on the baby brother's request. It seems likely that he will take the money and leave town, right? But if we take a moment, we will notice that before he ever left home, the baby brother had distanced himself from his family in his heart. Of course, this was not going to work the way the baby brother expected for a few reasons. One is that even though it's annoying to recognize wherever you go, there you are. I hate that. You, you're there. Me, I'm there wherever I go. Baby brother could take the money and run, but there's no way that he could escape himself and his preoccupation with himself as an individual rather than a person in a family and a community whose every action affected others. And there's a larger reason. It connects with our practice of Unitarian Universalism. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. urges that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So how do we close the distance between us as members of a shared community and actors in a shared future? Well, one thing is that we have to acknowledge that we are always present in our lives. The responsibility for joy and connection in our relationships lies with us, not solely with us, right? Like you can't have both parts of a relationship, but it cannot be tended without us. When the baby brother made a demand, he laid the responsibility on his dad to fill it. Where do we work that way in life? Expecting our needs to be met like we're ordering a pizza. Building and growing a community asks more of us than that. Our lives collectively are full of challenges and how we meet them, how we meet them really matters. One-sided treatment of others or using people as a means to an end reinforces habits of extreme individualism 
and weakens community. So the father found himself responding to the younger son's demands. He divided the property between them. And it wasn't long before a baby brother packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined, self-indulgent, and even drunk, he wasted everything he had. Have you ever wasted something and regretted it later? Probably not your inheritance, though maybe. There's a series of books by Beverly Cleary about a mischievous girl named Ramona. Ramona has an example of wasting that I don't want you to miss. Ramona noticed a brand new red and white and blue tube of toothpaste lying beside the wash basin. How smooth and shiny it looked with only one little dent where someone had squeezed it once. The tube was as good as new, and it was the large economy size. <laughs> Ramona was suddenly filled with longing. All her life, she wanted to squeeze toothpaste. Really squeeze it. <laughs> Not just one little squirt on her toothbrush, but a whole tube. A large economy-sized tube all at one time, just as she had longed to pull out a whole box of Kleenex. <laughs> you can just imagine what happens next. Ramona gives in to her impulse and squeezes the entire tube of toothpaste into the sink. She even squeezes some toothpaste roses on top. <laughs> like she's decorating a toothpaste cake. <laughs> Unfortunately, that doesn't turn out like Ramona wants it to either. Her mother makes her scoop it into a jar and use a little bit each day, while the rest of the family gets to use a brand new tube. <laughs> this example of wasting a resource is lighthearted, but it's also useful to us this morning because... Some of the things that are easiest to waste are the ones that are easy to overlook and take for granted. How would our perspective be transformed if we combine the idea that no one is disposable with both the knowledge and practice that nothing is permanent anyway? That time is slipping away even as we measure it and that people around us are living short essential lives. The Reverend Mark Morrison Reed gets at this question by reminding us that the central task of religious community is to unveil the bonds that bind us each to all. There is a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and the lives of others. We are meant to be together, traveling toward home. We are charged with appreciating what makes us different, while at the very same time, we nurture all the ways that we have our humanity in common. That may feel like a lot to ask at times. And it's true that there are many things in life that are difficult and valuable at the very same time. They're worth working at. Reverend Mark Morrison Reed goes on to use a metaphor of vision to signify perspective and understanding. He says that religious community is essential because alone our vision is too narrow to see all that must be seen and our strength too limited to do all that must be done. Together, our vision widens and our strength is renewed. But that was one of the baby brother's big problems. He had chosen to go it alone. And the consequences were intense. And they kept coming. After he had gone through all of his money, 
There was a bad famine throughout the country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to the fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry that he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. No money and a bad famine. If he'd had money, he might have been able to buy food, except that the famine meant that the country was experiencing crop and food shortages. It turns out that money can't always fix everything. And we hear over and over that money can't buy happiness. But people aren't too sure about that. So they make a lot of jokes about it. Amanda McMillan, writing for Time Magazine, reports that people feel happiness in different ways. And one possible factor is how much money they make, according to some new research. I mean, that's a factor. People with higher incomes tend to feel more positive emotions focused on themselves. And researchers say that people who earn less take greater pleasure in their re relationships with other people. Now look, don't come up to me and be like, Reverend Soto, I'm not like that. What they're talking about is a trend, right? How it tends to happen. They're not talking about you, but there's stuff to think about, right? Okay. <laughs> Unitarian Universalists keep very close tabs on research. <laughs> But here, the younger son, the baby brother, had stopped connecting with his family. He had moved to a far country so that when hard times hit, there was no safety with which he could tend to his emotional, spiritual, or physical needs. He was hungry, probably in every kind of way. The story says that that brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day. And here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, father, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. And he got right up and went home to his father. We may lose closeness with others. We may feel lost or lonely in our communities. We may even make mistakes. But there's a way back. The commitment we have to staying connected may be challenged by people's behavior. But it doesn't have to dissuade us from our conviction. In Paul Robeson, Gwendolyn Brooks underscores the talent of the singer as an example of the call to support one another on the journey. She's talking about Paul's beautiful, large singing voice. Warning in music words, devout and large, that we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. Not minding each other's business, are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Brooks describes that call as music words, devout and large. There are so many things about being a human that cannot be reduced to words. Do you ever have that feeling? Occasionally, music suffices. Sometimes art depicts things about being human that run between us like currents. Together, we are better together. Being each other's business, working for each other's survival, means that we allow for course correction, our own and that of others. We honor the tenderness of a changing heart. The younger son dropped the pretense of making demands and simply said how he was wrong. He asked to be taken in. Now, very clearly and distinctly, I have to tell you that I am not urging you to forgive in ways that could leave you exposed to more harm. That's not what that's about. One of your tools for this task is boundaries. 
which describe expectations you set for your own treatment and your own benefit. Again, it's not a set of either or propositions. We must use discernment in reconciliation. Then the younger son set out to go home. He probably felt ashamed of the choices that led him back home empty handed. He probably felt worried about how his family, especially his father, of whom he'd made demands, would receive him. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him. The father's heart pounding as he ran out to embrace his younger son, and he kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I have sinned against you and against God. I don't deserve to be called. And it's a touching reunion scene. Except, except the son carries with him a burden of burning shame. In his dad's expressions of love, they're meant to reassure him that he's home. But the shame is keeping that from sinking in. Brene Brown describes shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. The younger son was carrying a heap of shame on his face and shoulders. He was so ashamed that even as his dad expressed love, he continued to apologize. It's a signal that we may see in our own lives, a signal that we are being too hard on ourselves. We need to practice self-compassion. What if the younger son chose to receive the love? Well, he might stop apologizing and say thank you instead. Thank you, Dad, for running out to meet me. One March, I spent a few weeks in Chicago taking seminary classes in freezing temperatures and fierce winds because Chicago. <laughs> then I rode the Amtrak home, arriving in downtown Portland, Oregon, on Easter morning. I didn't want to miss the holiday service, so I drove in my scooter directly from the station to one of the big churches downtown. I was a bit nervous, thinking that folks might judge a disheveled traveler loaded down with suitcases. Instead, a remarkable thing happened. The greeter at the door ran out to meet me on the sidewalk. He wanted me to know that I would be able to enter the sanctuary easily. He wanted to show me the most accessible way. I was definitely welcome there. This part of the wisdom story helps to underscore that while beloved community is important, it's important, it's the thing, without a, without a warm welcome to it, our mission is not accomplished. Harriet Tubman put it this way. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. I'm going to take a second to say that we're always building and growing. And your welcome here is beautiful. You can keep growing it just like that. The younger son was much like us. He was not meant to be a stranger. He was beloved, even if the weight of the shame of his past kept him from feeling like it. Kept him from feeling like he belonged, even though he felt the need to keep apologizing. But his father wasn't listening to all those apologies. He was calling to the servants, quick, Bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. 
My son is here. I thought he was dead, but now he's alive. Given up for lost, and now he's found. And they began to have a wonderful time. The dad's joy was palpable and irrepressible. Clean clothes, a jewel, symbol of how precious his son was to him, new shoes, and most of all, a celebration, complete with a barbecue. This matters to remind you that you are meant for love. Even if you can't be proud of all your choices, and honestly, who could be? Being a human is complicated. You are still meant for love. Dr. Rebecca Parker puts it this way. Even when our hearts are broken by our own failure or the failure of, or, or the failure of others, cutting into our lives, even when we have done all we can and life is still broken, there is a universal love that has never broken faith with us and never will. The journeys we take away from love and back to love may be difficult and complicated. Things may turn out differently than we hope. Remember this. We are each and all people meant for love. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. And it is love that will never let us go. We can share that love far and wide. Let it be so. Let us be the ones to make it so.